All right. I'd like to thank you all for being here. We are going to be talking about games. And we have a tremendous group of panelists up here. But before I introduce them, I wanted to, to go a little bit into what we're actually going to be talking about. And uh, specifically, we, we talked about games a little bit in the keynote. And one of the things we mentioned is that three out of every four Android users play games. So this is a huge community. Um, uh, the last time we even announced numbers, we had over a billion Android activations. And our play game services have had 100 million new users in six months. And uh, to some of that, you know, some people say that is the fastest growing network ever. I just think it's a lot of users. And what does it actually contain? So we're talking about achievements, leaderboards, multiplayer, and game gifts, plus the two new services we announced here at I.O., uh, which are saved games and quests. And uh, I hope you all come. There's another session right after this, which you, you know, if you're watching this on video, it's all going to be on video as well, where Greg Hartrell goes into a huge amount of detail uh, about what we're doing and our motivations behind what we're doing. So I do hope you attend that. It's going to be right after this if you're here live. Let's go through our panel. We've got a great group of people here. I'm going to introduce them very briefly. So we start off with Sarab Ahuja. He's from Glue Mobile. Uh, Glue Mobile makes awesome action games. Uh, they really are, uh, are one of the first companies that really got heavily into free to play. We have uh, Ari Cardasis from Space Inch, which is a really cool company. You should definitely look up the stuff that they're doing. Uh, they just came out with their, their latest game, Make It Rain, is awesome. It's this, it's this crazy combination of social commentary and spoof. And, uh, and he was also, of course, the de designer of Disco Bees, which is a really great game as well. Uh, we have Guillermo Lachaud uh, from Gameloft. I don't think I have to say anything about Gameloft. Their games are epic. A bunch of them are on the floor if you go look at uh, what we're showing on Android TV today. And, uh, um, but just super, super high quality games uh, in every genre. Uh, we have uh, uh, Keith Pitchelman from Concrete. Uh, it's great the variety of companies we have here and the variety of experiences we have here and the way all of these companies actually can benefit by uh, the stuff we're doing around gaming on Google Play. And uh, Concrete is a 25-person company. They're from, they're from Minneapolis, and they make the coolest multiplayer bowling game that, uh, that, 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 you, that is on Google Play. It is, it is really, really awesome, and you should also go check it out. And then finally, we have Lloyd to Lewis. Uh, he is here representing Electronic Arts, and I don't even have to tell you all of the things Electronic Arts has done, uh, and they are, are they, again, a company that does amazingly high-quality games in every genre on Google Play. So that is our distinguished panel. And we're going to be talking not just about play game services, but we're also going to be talking about the game industry in general and Google Play. So here is my first question for our panelists. And uh, out of the play games features that you've integrated into your games, which have been the most valuable? And we'll start, we'll start from, from we'll, go, we'll, we'll start this direction from now. So uh, for Glue and for our users, I would say CloudSave has been the most valuable. It helps us provide that seamless experience. People nowadays have their phones, their tablets, and now some of you have the Android TV. Uh, when you can take your game back and forth. Uh, Deer Hunter 2014 works across all of them. And it's free, you know, so it works <laughs> free hosting. All right. Um, hi. So for us, we're very, very small. Um, I'm a designer and a developer, and I'm sitting here. So um, it, anything that we can get out of Google Play game services that can eliminate some of the overhead for us is really super important. Uh, in particular, achievements is great for us because uh, our games are not multiplayer, and it really helps engagement a lot. Um, and yeah, it's been a great experience. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Talking about Gameloft, um, so as Dan said, we have a wide portfolio of games, and it's true that when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to multiplayer and cloud save, we're using our own um, system. So we're mainly using achievements and leaderboards in our games, and I would, see, I would say that when it comes to achievements, this is where we've seen the, the, the highest engagement, because when it comes to most of our games now are free to play, and when you're talking about users, you want first to have user acquisition, but then engagement and retention is really important, and so achievements, have achieved to bring competition, uh, and I think also the fact that now there's game profiles into the, 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 the main standalone app 
is very interesting because we think it's going to continue this trend of having people compete for the games and being able to see what their friends are doing. Yeah, I, I can say personally, um, I went and played um, our IO hunt, IO hunt here at uh, Google IO, which is awesome. If you guys who are actually attending haven't played it yet, you should, partially just because there are a lot of achievement points to be had, and uh, I leveled up my profile right here at, at uh, Google IO. Yeah, for us, um, our, our flagship game right now is uh, PBA Bowling Challenge, and we've integrated all the game services right now, and they've all been really big for us. Uh, but the biggest by far is probably uh, the multiplayer in the game services. When we first released PBA Bowling Challenge, it didn't have the, uh, the multiplayer mode. Um, we quickly started getting a lot of fans, a lot of users, and it was really tough to keep up with enough content for all those users. Uh, you know, they kept on coming back asking for more alleys and more, you know, things unlock more achievements. Um, by adding multiplayer, that really opened up to where people could play forever. You know, they could play random people, their friends, um, and each game was a little different. And it was, you know, it's kind of funny having to be real time. We were actually looking for an asynchronous type of uh, multiplayer. Mm -hmm. And real time has been fantastic because it's actually exciting to watch the other player roll through the different bowling balls and kind of see, oh, hey, look at, the, look at that one. Oh, they used this ball. Um, and and it's, uh, yeah, it's really been great for engagement. And uh, you, can, you can see your users talk about it a lot and talk about how they play against each other. So we've been uh, focusing much more on uh, achievements in leaderboards uh, through a great many of our games. And uh, we've really seen a, a tremendous amount of value out of that, uh, cause it, mainly because it's a, a seamless experience and a consistent experience for our users across our games. But if we step back a little bit, um, the most valuable feature we've gotten out of game services is uh, just having a, a, a single sign-on identity that follows the user between uh, all their devices. So your achievements follow you on your, on, your, on your phone versus your tablet and now on your television and so on. Um, and, and just having that uh, experience across all of those devices has, has been uh, fantastic. Yeah, the, uh, you know, for everyone who's on the Android team, we pretty much won't play a game unless it has some sort of cloud safe feature because we're always reflashing devices, you know, as things are in development, we're testing, we're moving from device to device. Most of us have at least a tablet and a phone. And we want to play on the best device that we happen to have at the time. And it's just been, I mean, like I'll, be, I'll tell someone, this game is awesome. And they're like, does it have cloud safe? That's the first question they'll ask me. And um, so it really means a lot. And I think we're seeing more and more people out there in, in, in the community and uh, actually representing a, a very similar kind of demographic. So uh, the next question, as we look into future launch titles, you know, we're, we're talking again, I mean, I know they're talking about play game services a lot here, but I'm hoping we can kind of stretch the topics out uh, beyond this. Um, but if you look to launch future titles, how do you plan to leverage uh, what we're doing in play game services? So we're going to keep using what we do with achievements, leaderboards, cloud save, retain those power users. But uh, the new features, gifting, we just implemented it in Attorney Warriors 3. We're experimenting with that, made popular by Candy Crush, of course. But again, we get a free way of trying that system through, through GPGS. So that's happening. We're actually putting it quests and snapshots of saved games in uh, RoboCop right now going live early July, and we're excited to see how the metrics of those pan out, and that's the current plan for GPGS. Yeah. And, and, and it's okay, the package name for saved games is Snapshot, so if you're actually looking at the API, that's what it, that's what it looks like, but, but the, the, the consumer name is, is saved games. <laughs> Uh, so our games tend to be somewhat one player at this point. We're not really implementing a lot of social stuff. So I think moving forward, not only um, are we interested in competitive gaming, but also collaborative gaming. We had a game about a year ago called Say the Same Thing, which was a collaborative game. And I think we didn't ever quite figure out how to monopolize on that. And I think that Google Play Game Services is the kind of thing where we can really get people engaged with their friends to work together to achieve things in games. I think when it comes to games, we're really working on bringing quality games, really HD, AAA games, but also on the social part of it. And I think where Google Play Game Services is really interesting is once again, the leaderboards, um, the achievements, and the new quests also is very interesting for us because it's gonna bring something new. We wanna bring something unique to the Android community. 
and this is a great way for us to continue launching it with all our new games, implementing it all the time. For us, it's a great way to really keep it social, having sure everybody can see what their other friends are doing, what games they're playing. And for us, it's a, it's a key strategy to have it implemented in most of our upcoming titles. Yeah, we um, will certainly keep uh, using all the, the Google Play game services. They've been really valuable so far. I think uh, we're most excited about Quest. I mean, we really look at Quest as being a way to have live events. If you look at a lot of the big games out there now, they you know have live events, short events, longer events. Um, you know, we're always looking at ways to keep our users engaged. Um, you know, keep the game. Uh, with you know, with new content and by you know not having again to build new alleys and tournaments all the time, we can do a lot. I think with quests and, and making those events. So I'm going to go back uh, to my previous question, uh, my previous answer, um, and build on that. So uh, when we're looking at our users and we realize that they have multiple devices on, on different platforms, and we want to give them a consistent experience across all these devices. Uh, for us, cloud saves are. are particularly uh, uh, game safe, so particularly exciting, especially with the new features that are coming up, um, that we can leverage across uh, different uh, uh, device types as well as the, uh, different platforms. Um, and so for us, that's going to be a very uh, exciting uh, uh, feature to leverage. Um, and I wanted to make the comment, too, that uh, it's interesting how game services uh, is almost becoming its own game platform. We can start <laughs> leveraging the users in, in Google Play as you guys are kind of put, putting that competitive nature against uh, uh, users of, uh, uh, that may not even be friends. And so as we uh, build on achievements and leaderboards, we can then leverage Google's um, competitive uh, 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 features and then keep engaging our users that way. No, absolutely. I, I, I'll say completely that part of the reason I went off and, and, and played IO Hunt here was that I was trying to uh, outdo uh, uh, Bob Meese's profile score. Bob Meese is the head of our business development team here. Uh, point of honor. So, uh, but yeah, and the other thing I think it's really exciting too is that, is that you know, we have the services both across to iOS. We're launching actually um, both saved games and quests simultaneously for not just iOS, but also our cross platform C, SDK. And um, so I'm really excited about giving people who have devices that are in both families actually the ability to play together and the ability also to bring saves from one device to another. All right. Feedback from players. You know, what do, you, what, what, you, know, what do they say you know, when, when you integrate this, when you don't integrate it? Um, you know, just, just kind of talk about it. So it's mostly positive. People love the fact, you know, the, the competitive elements which were missing before or were not going from one device to another. So they like that. There are some negative which, uh, you know, uh, was just touched about, like, lack of it being a gamer network, like where people struggle finding their friends to come, you know, and inviting them to play and play with because they're not in their Google Plus circles. It's getting better, and I think it will only get better if everybody in this room starts putting GPGS in their game so that we can all leverage each other's users and everybody's there so it's easy to find your friends to play with. Um, well, I try to stay as far from customer service as I can, but um, <laughs> we, we release our games with Google Play so um, nobody's ever complaining about it not being in there. and. Um, it's been great. I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody has anything negative to say to us, and it, it's definitely helpful for them. It's funny when it comes to gaming where users are happy, they're just playing your game, but you don't hear them that much. But actually, when you don't implement the services in your game, so we've implemented it in most of our new games, but sometimes legacy games don't necessarily have it at launch and need updates. And so this is usually when we hear customers saying, where are achievements, where are uh, leaderboards from Google Play Game Services? Because I think, once again, uh, it's creating a community and people are, are when it's there, they're, they're enjoying it, but when it's not there, they're not, not selling it. So I think really now it's part of what users are expecting. So we've never received any complaints about it, but I think it's really something that now users are expecting when they're playing on, the, on their games. So it really has become a, a truthful gaming uh, experience for users. Yeah, one, one of the things I'm excited about in, in, in going from our original feature, which was um, app state or game, uh, game state, to uh, now we new have well, we have new. Thank you, I can speak. Uh, in, in terms of uh, game saves, it actually shows up as a badge now, 
Uh, and that was, that was a big problem. A lot of people didn't know when people were actually uh, implementing our Cloud Safe feature, and now it'll be right up front. Immediately I know, yes, it's going to be there. Yes, I know my state's going to be preserved. So I think it, it's a really important thing for users to be able to see. Yeah, our, uh, our users absolutely love game services. Uh, you know, when we added multiplayer, I mean, they are definitely now the most vocal and been playing for the longest. <laughs> um, and, and then uh, with uh, uh, achievements, I mean, it's, it's become more of a hobby for them now where if something's wrong, we hear about it immediately. Or if you see somebody who's hacked into the system and gets a, a high score and a leaderboard, uh, we definitely do not find it first. We, they tell us within about two seconds that something's wrong. Um, they, they watch all that closely. Uh, they, they love the multiplayer. They love all the different services. So. But talk now. You know, your users have actually gone and built their own community around around the game. Talk yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's really been interesting. We uh, after the game was out for a little bit, we happened to run across that somebody created a PBA bowling challenge uh, Google Plus page, yeah, running it themselves, and we just kind of were watching it for a while until we finally joined in to help them out. Um, but yeah, and that's I mean they they are so social. Uh, they love talking to each other. Uh, they're posting videos of how they use different bowling balls. They put different spin on the balls, and they uh, uh, I mean spend a lot of time in there. In fact, that's uh, one of the things we've learned from our users. If they're that passionate about you know coming out and creating this community outside the game, that's obviously something we should have inside the game. Mm -hmm. Have you have you guys have you guys thought about actually doing like a YouTube integration and making it so users can post videos over there and? Absolutely, Dan. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, it, it, we, as soon as it was funny, we actually talked about that early on. We were like, ah, do people really want to post a you know a, a roll down the lane? We, we kind of actually decided people weren't going to be that excited about it. Well, we were absolutely wrong. And uh, and yeah, we've been researching exactly how we're going to do that now. That's great. Uh, so for us, <coughs> excuse me, for us, uh, no news is good news. Um, <laughs> we've integrated uh, game services in, like I said earlier, a, a great host of our games, um, and uh, we don't really uh, hear negative feedback to kind of uh, reiterate the earlier points, which is, uh, from our perspective, fantastic. Um, and so for that reason, we're just going to keep uh, integrating more and more of the features and see where we can take it. Awesome. All right. So challenges now. And now this is like, obviously we talked about one. You know, first of all, we want a better social graph. Uh, that's, that's, that's the first thing we mentioned. What, what else can we do better? Uh, I think now that everybody is starting to put it in, I'm hoping that um, you guys have enough data. So one of the challenges is acquiring the right users. Hmm. Um, and like the recommendation engine in Google Play Games can mm -hmm. help you know, everybody who's making similar games and like, getting the power users introduced to the new game which is similar, that will be really helpful for the ecosystem. I think like, I, I'm not sure how you guys are doing it, but it will be great if that's happening right now. What do you guys think of the, in general, the, the demographic features that, 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 we, that, we, that we put into the, the developer dashboard? Yes, I, the, the entire analytics like, is very it's high level, but mm -hmm. it's very, you know, we all have, of course, our analytics back end, but that, the high level stuff you get from Google, uh, Google Play Games analytics is very useful, like the demographics, the retention, all of that information. And now there's more tools, which I think Ellie showed uh, the Google Analytics and uh, actually measuring your user acquisition campaigns, which we're already starting to look into today. So I think all that stuff is very helpful. Uh, well, I mean, as a developer who's spread pretty thin most of the time, I think the biggest complaint I would have is just sort of not really knowing the full landscape of what Google Play Game Services can do. Uh, I know that there's a lot out there, and we've done achievements and, um, and sign-in, and I think we're working on some leaderboards. But like demographics and uh, analytics, I didn't really know that existed. So I think maybe communicating with us better to know what's useful for maybe different types of developers at different stages in their company cycle. Yeah, I think, I think we, you know, we, um, we talked a lot about, our, our, about the play analytics features when we actually announced it at GDC, but we haven't gone around trumpeting it. Uh, and part of, the, part of the reason we didn't do that was it wasn't quite done. Um, we didn't integrate demographic features until, until a few months later. And we real, really felt that when you actually can not only see, you know, look at the five day and the 10 day and 15 day retention, look at how that compares with achievements, then you can actually see which demographics you're resonating with. That just adds a lot of, a lot of uh, important data for our, for our, uh, our game makers. And uh, so I think now we're more excited to talk about it as, as, as a feature. I think we've, at GameLife, we've always tried to be innovative. So it's true that lots, 
lots of innovative features and social features, we've tried to implement them within our own backend. So I think one of the challenges was to integrate all those features, but not to duplicate what we were already doing. So it's finding new innovative ways to bring additional content to our users. Um, and it's worked great until now, so we're really thrilled about the services. And I think one of the ma main challenges we've seen uh, with, the, with the services is the sign-in process. We think um, a great evolution of the service would be to, to ease and to, uh, to help users having kind of an opt-in option where they could have a single sign-on. They would need to just once say, okay, I accept to sign in into those services into all of my games and never have to sign in again. So I think this is, for me, uh, an evolution that would be very beneficial to the, to the services. Yeah, it's always, it's always a balance. You know, I, think, I think at Google, you know, one of the things that, that we take incredibly seriously is privacy. And it's always, it's always making sure that we give the best possible service to our users while making sure they have absolutely the most control over, the, over every piece of information they share. And I think, I'm, you know, I'm, and I'm hoping we can figure out a way to strike that balance that's even less obtrusive than what we've done already. But I think, I think that, for, that for us is always going to be a challenge. Yeah, I can think of uh, a couple things. One minor thing would just be uh, with our leaderboards in the, in the bowling game. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people, when they bowl, they compare it by average. So we'd love to be able to have you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, a leaderboard with like, type, leaderboard type thing with average so they can kind of go up and down, not just go up making points. I know we, we have leaderboards that can go only down and leaderboards that can go only <laughs> up. But we actually don't have the ability to have an average like that. Which would be great if that really happened in bowling, if your average always went up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the other peak, big thing... Peak, it, peak average. <laughs> it, it is, uh, you know, mul multiplayer is the biggest service we've added that's really helped out our games quite a bit. Um, you know, if we could add more to that, like right now we have users all over the board as far as experience. Um, we, we started out the game, we actually had a cap of level 99, and people blew through that immediately. <laughs> and then we raised it to, I don't know why, 199. Of course, that didn't last very long. And, and now today, we have a cap of 999, and people are hitting that as well. Um, it, it's a challenge when we match up players that are, say, like level 750 to somebody who's level 10. You know, it doesn't make sense at all, and they'll drop out right away. Um, it'd be nice if we had something where uh, if somebody was trying to play a game, they were level X, it started from that level and kind of grew out from there to try to find somebody that's at least that's closest to that level type of thing. Or maybe even that level, maybe it's uh, how, how good they are. So maybe it's average or something like that as well, or combination. Yeah, so, so right now the, you, you, can, you, can you can split up game matching um, by, by variables that are fixed. So you can say, never match anyone who's level one against someone who's level 999, but that means that you could potentially end up in a system, in, in a situation where no one gets matched. And, uh, and so that's a challenge. I think, I think for us, adding more variables and making matchmaking smarter is one of the things that we, you know, we really are, are taking to heart and are trying to do going forward. Uh, so I want to second the, uh, the, the frictionless sign-in as well. Um, anything that gets our uh, players into the game and enjoying the content without you know, a wall uh, to get through is, is fantastic. Um, but I also want to add, uh, for us, you know, we've got so many studios, internal and external to EA, um, and we've got one developer portal account to rule them all. <laughs> um, so when, when we're talking about something as trivial as adding an achievement or adding a leaderboard, um, having to do that uh, over email with you know, so many uh, studios all uh, vying for the, for the same priority, it gets very, very difficult very quickly. So uh, what I would really like to see is, uh, is automation tools yeah. so that our game teams can actually build uh, tools into their pipelines so they can update uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, achievement leaderboards, whatever else they have um, without uh, us being a bottleneck to them. Yeah, and especially when you're trying to internationalize all your achievements. I know that's a lot of work. I, I think that, you know, it was funny. When we were first designing achievements, we actually had an internal debate. And, uh, and there was one side that argued we should do everything through XML and, and, and just have you upload things to the portal. And then the other side was like, but that will make it really confusing for people who are starting out. And so I think we, we, we're at that point now where people understand what achievements are. They understand how, uh, you know, what they contain. And now it's time to actually just simplify the process and make it easier for everyone. Sorry, just one other thing I want to add on to with the mini studios problem. Um, we also have a, a, a very real issue with game teams wanting to look at data in the mm -hmm. portal. Um, and while the, the, the portal has a, a, a number of uh, excellent tools for granular permissions, we want to see that fleshed out a bit more so our game teams can log in and look at their data, see how their games are performing, especially in game services. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really good point, too, in terms of um, we, uh, game services are kind of locked out from most, from, from most people from seeing the uh, console unless you're actually a registered developer. So people in support and in services can't see that stuff. So that's another thing for us to take too hard as we add more and more features like statistics in there. Uh, let's see. Next. Oh, okay. New features. So this is, we're talking specifically about um, save games and quests. Uh, what are you most excited about having your teams look at? So for us, save game is kind of an extension of what we were already doing. So the, the fact that you can have pictures and it will show up and play games, that is pretty exciting. We saw a little glimpse of it earlier on uh, somebody's mm -hmm. phone. Uh, even more excited about quests. Um, we were already doing some of it in our games, which are more social. Uh, so we're most excited about quests I think, and having some sort of, uh, sort of uh, co-op quests is going to be even more useful down the line. So that, to me, looks pretty cool right now. Yeah, I mean, we, we use save games in Disco Bees, um, which goes pretty well, uh, not through Google Play Game Services, but we, we will. And um, in Make It Rain, it, I know that the second we start doing that, people are going to be using it on two devices at once, mm -hmm. immediately. Uh, and we're gonna, it's going to be a challenge to deal with that. There's a lot of edge cases that we're going to need to deal with. So I think that hopefully that can manage that kind of situation for us. And, uh, and make it smooth. Yeah, I think that's always a challenge, especially in a game where there's a, there's a chance element, and there really is a chance element in it, you know, where, where all of a sudden you have people who are playing on three or four devices, and they're saying, which one actually does the best, and it changes the, you know, it's, so I think, I think that, is, that is hard, and I think that, um, uh, unfortunately, if you're allowing people to play offline to begin with, you know, there's, there's no great solution. I think there's a number of potential interesting, interesting solutions to that one. Um, but, you know, definitely how, how you handle that conflict resolution is tough. I think we're really excited about quests as well. Um, we already have time-limited events in our games, but what's interesting about quests is that you can set up new quests, of course, all the time. You can reuse them, and you can also um, change the kind of rewards that are in the game. So let's say, for example, we're doing a time-limited event in, in our game. We can actually do a, time, uh, a quest with achievements, unique achievements that can be unlocked. So once again, it comes back to using, again, the achievement feature, but you can additionally use the quest to further enhance this, this feature of the, the services. And, and for us, we think that time-limited quests like this is really important, once again, for, for engagement for, towards our users, just to, to have them come back to the game, keep on playing and having new challenges within the game. And, and we're looking forward also to co-op quests, I think, which would be a, a very interesting uh, thing. Yeah, quests, the quests to me are just super cool. I mean, you know, I think that, um, you know, people who are, I don't know how many people, how many people in the audience here are, are actually in the gaming industry, just, just, just by a show of hands? It's great. I mean, so one of the things we've seen, uh, and you know, this is what I've seen, I've been, and I didn't even introduce myself at the beginning of this panel. I've actually been doing developer relations. I've been a developer advocate for four years um, here at Google. And so we've watched the, the industry really shift. And it started off that we were in an era where games were one-shot things, where people, where people would play them on their phone for a couple of weeks or a month, they'd go on to the next game. And now we're seeing that all of, this, all of the successful games are actually really games as services. Almost every one of them has a life cycle and an arc and changes that are planned over a long period of time. And one of the challenges with, with when you have a game that has a long tail like that is actually keeping it live for your users and keeping your users engaged. And, and so people had ops teams that would actually set up events and they would write all sorts of code to handle that and it, would, it really would require a lot of resources. So that was, when we thought about Quest, it was you know, how do we keep people engaged in a really cool way where they don't have to build their own back end and they don't have to have an ops team. And uh, so for us, that's, you know, it was really the next step in, in, in taking our services forward. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention that because, you know, it, it's something I'm kind of passionate about, actually. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. Uh, quests, uh, we're so excited about quests. Um, you know, we, we're always trying to keep our users engaged, and they burn through our content so fast. Uh, you know, and, and again, for us to build a uh, new alley, new lane, new tournaments, um, you know, we, we have, uh, um, you know, holiday tournaments, like a Halloween tournament, Halloween alley. It takes a lot of time to build it out, and we use it once a year. So it's, it's you know, uh, having quests, having these real-time events uh, will add uh, a lot for our users and keep them, hopefully, um, very engaged. And I can't wait to start just trying them out and try out different lengths, try out different types of quests um, and, and different types of rewards and really find out what our users enjoy. Uh, you, you said that very well. I can't really add on to... 
That's perfect. Um, uh, so, but I, I'd like to then go back to uh, SAVES, which is my second choice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like SAVES, the, the game SAVES specifically because um, uh, uh, one, for well, two reasons. Uh, one, it's so easy for us to actually save data onto the cloud. There's really not a whole lot of work involved, and we don't have to build our backend for uh, uh, for saving that data. We don't have to uh, uh, administer our own CDN or go through all of that rigmarole. Um, so it alleviates a lot of stress on our side. Um, and then the other side too is it's, it's, it's fantastic for our users. They know that uh, if we save data on game saves on the Google Cloud, it, it's very very well trusted, it's there. They know that um, even if they uninstall the game and come back later, their data is still going to be there if we do our job right, of course. Um, but I, I do like the fact that our, that our players um, have that, that inherent trust in Google that we can then leverage. And of course, like I said, it saves our developers to focus on the fun. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, when we envisioned uh, Play Game Services, it was how to how to get developers the best opportunity to focus on making games and let us do some of the kind of boring things like uh, all this back end stuff. Um, to me, it's actually really exciting, but I, you know, I know that, uh, that there are a lot of game developers who'd much rather add game content and figure out how to, ha how to handle cloud saves and have the server infrastructure to do that. The, uh, the thing that uh, I'm really excited about with the new cloud save feature too is that we actually uh, are now making them social. So you can actually, other players can actually uh, see the snapshot of your progress uh, and actually kind of figure out how to compete with you in that way. When we originally introduced the feature, it was entirely non-social. And, uh, and so that, you know, we realized, how could we, how could we have a feature of our game service that didn't actually allow people to be competitive? And so that was one of the driving forces. The other thing is that everyone said, we want bigger saves. You know, and and so, so I'm happy to say the new feature allows for three megabyte saves that are actually tied into your Google, uh, Google Drive account. You can have multiple saves as well. So as many as you know, as much space as the user is willing to give you, you can uh, you can have, and that's I think that's really exciting too. And especially if you when you think about the scenario, of, all right, maybe someone's playing the game on three devices. Well, you could do a conflict, or you could simply say, well, here are your saves, and kind of you know pick which path you want to go on, and uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so. This is uh, beyond play game services. This is really, you know, and I think this is probably the most open question, and uh, I, wanna, I wanna go on this for a while. Uh, but in the last, in the, you know, I've, I've watched in the last four years the business of gaming change a lot on mobile. And so, so the question is, how, how has it changed for you in, in the past year, and what, what trends do you see coming up in the future? So for us, uh, just the sheer amount of growth and downloads and revenue on Google Play has been amazing, like it has, started to catch up and the gap is very narrow to iOS. I'm happy that the finer analytical minds at Glue are now looking, taking deeper dive in the Android data, which means that, are, that we're gonna be catering our games also you know, more towards what the Android users like, or at least as much towards what the Android users like. So I'm pretty happy for like, you know, just the growth has just been amazing, you know, to, to downloads and revenue. Well, uh <laughs> Today's the 26th, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yesterday is the anniversary of us setting up our first repo. So one year ago, Space Inch was just um, twinkle in our eye. So happy birthday, Space Inch. But um, a lot has changed in the last year. I mean, we didn't release a game until October, and our first Android game came out in, I think, March. Um, so it's all very new to us, and we're accumulating knowledge and and learning everything we can and really excited to engage the old features, which we haven't gotten to, as well as the new ones, which are coming up soon. So, I mean, when you look, when you look forward in the next year, I mean, I, you know, your team has produced a really diverse set of games in a very, very short period of time. You know, what, what are the themes that are resonating in, you know, in terms of, in terms of the, the games you've built? Um, I think personality is what we try to get out of our games. I mean, there's a lot of games out there uh, that monetize well, that, um, that have great engagement, and I think that we need a leg up because we're small. We don't have a big analytics department. We don't have a big marketing department or UA department. So we try to put a little bit of heart and love into everything we do and make the games um, you know, cute and engaging and lovable. Um, and I think that without services that provide some additional infrastructure for us, that would never really be possible because we'd have cute and nothing else. <laughs> so uh, it gives us that, that leg up. 
I, it's super exciting to me that a, that a company can go from a repo getting created uh, to having you know three successful games across multiple platforms in in a year. I mean, I think I think that says a lot about where we are in this industry and a lot about the about the opportunity that's still there. Yeah. yeah. That's right. the, the real question would be what hasn't changed in over a year on Google Play? I mean, the storage <laughs> shelf ch itself changed completely. Uh, all new UI, um, new types of collections, algorithmic based. Um, so I would say really like it's great to see the Google Play Store catching up, so really tremendous results in terms of downloads and really the, the gap decreasing in terms of revenue as well with other key platforms. Um, so it's been great, a great 2013 year and uh, hopefully a great 2014 year growing even further. Um, I think for us, um, we're really looking into new platforms, so Android TV is one, but we're also excited with the Android Wear, with Android Auto, I mean, there's so many new ways to try to reach our users, to try to transform the user experience and to bring new, new values to games that, I mean, we're really looking forward to, once again, innovation and seeing what we can bring to, to, to users with our games. So in, in terms of, um, as we talk about this, this past year, uh, you know, what have you seen in terms of Asia and it being a force in your games? I know that's one of the challenges for, for game makers that are outside of Asia, is actually kind of cracking into that market. Um, how, how, is that, how has that worked for your, for, for your team? So, so we're, we're really a global company, so we do have offices all around the world, but it's true, when you look at Asia, it's a really specific market. It has its own uh, customs. The, the users are really playing different types of games. So. As a publisher, I think for us it was really, it's really important that what we're trying to do is really to adapt our offer, so content of our games, pricing, and the way we're addressing them. We're, we really know it's a... I mean, we, we went from being global to trying to offer the same service, then localization, and now it's really offering a customized experience to those types of markets. Yeah, we've, um, so Concrete Software, we've been around for almost 11 years now making mobile games. It's been quite a ride. Um, and the biggest change, it seemed like, over the long haul has been, you know, pricing. We started off, we were selling mobile games for $20 a shot. And, you know, we got pressed down, kind of went to advertising a little bit. Um, but then, really, this last year, we had to make a fundamental shift where we really had to start thinking about our games as not just being a product to get out the door and trying to make a great game, get a, you know, good review, but our games are now services, and we really, you know, think about when we make a game that this is a service, and that's, you know, where Quest will come in, where we can add a lot more um, content for our users. But yeah, in this last year, you know, we've, you know we used to release you know, maybe like six, seven games a year, and now this last year we released one. I mean, it's really been a, a, a challenge to make sure that we retain our users, that we always have new content, and that uh, we really think more as a service company. Uh, so for us, um, it, it's really been a, a, a mindset change. Um, if we're going to talk about Asia just for a second, uh, you know, in the past, you know, I've been in the industry for 13 some odd years, and, and when we make a product, uh, you go through localization efforts, you just translate everything out, and you kick it out the door, and you hope the rest of the world likes it. Um, but the mindset change on our end, uh, specifically now, is it's not just about localization, it's about actually culturalization, taking a, a game and really adapting it for, uh, for the, the Asian market uh, in the way that it resonates to them, and oftentimes we get a product that's very different from the one that we have in, in, in the United States. Um, and so that's been a very, very big change uh, for us. And then we've also gone through the same learnings um, in terms of, you know, you just can't uh, 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 you know, go to the old way of doing things, which was uh, make a thing, ship a thing, and then pray. Uh, you now make a thing, you ship a thing, and then you keep on building it. You know, as you learn what your users like, you, you get into their behavioral uh, play patterns, you see, you know, what content uh, they really enjoy, and you keep building on that. You just keep on uh, uh, making the game better for many years on end. So when you, when you, think of, when you guys think of a, of a game, how many, how many updates in the future are you guys thinking in terms of when you, when you have a game that you know is a service? You know, how, how far in the future are you thinking in, in terms oh, of... Oh, very long. We, uh, we will uh, plan for years on end um, for, a, for a successful title, yeah. So I'll, I'll quickly yeah. comment on Asia, too, and I completely Absolutely. agree. Yeah, please do. Um, on the culturalization part, it is the key. Like, we've had one or two successes, but we realized like I personally went there too, and uh, we, you know, we partnered with companies like Colapla to, and giving them our game engines and letting them 
use their expertise, you know, for the Japanese audience to adapt to the, you know, the monetizations, like the live events, those kind of things, which work really well, the characters. So I think that culturalization is like the key to success in Asia right now. Now, how, when you talk about culturalization, what, what are, you, are you talking about changes to, to marketing, to gameplay, to, uh, to just character design? You know, how, how deep do you end up going? We, we're going pretty deep uh, for this project uh, with Colopolis. So we, we had, they really liked our uh, 3D engine we had for our game Heroes of Destiny, and they have that, and we like what they are doing, of course, so everybody knows how successful their games are in Japan, and so they, we've hired another developer, so they are working with them, they're changing the monetization, they're changing the characters to give them a different look and feel, which appeals to the Japanese audience. The game, you know, the level design, everything is changing, it's just the core engine, the 3D engine is the same, but everything else, the gameplay is changing to uh, suit the Japanese audience. I think it's been really interesting. I think we've seen we've seen both directions. We've seen we've seen companies from Asia, you know, make make strides in, into European and U.S. markets, and it's always been, how do we take something we know works in terms of a general concept, and and bring that same concept to these markets in a way that's palatable and exciting for them. And I think I think, and I think there's there have been a couple of games that have really done that successfully. But I think it's hard. It's, there's no question about it. And um, so in terms of in terms of um, in terms of game success, you know, what, 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 how do you define success in terms of a game? It's, so keeping users in the game, like, so the retention, like, the money, like, follows. I mean, we can see even from chat apps, right? Like, if mm -hmm. you keep users in your app, you will get eventually paid for it. So retention is, the, you know, the key. Like, there's so many apps and games out there, like, Users have short attention span. Asian users have less, even shorter attention span than the Western users. So it's key to keep them entertained, keep the updates coming, like plan out like a, at least a year in ahead of what content we're going to keep because they eat up content fast and then move on to the next one if you don't give them something fast when they're done with like those three levels. Like make sure you have the fourth, fifth, sixth ready to go. Uh, well, of our three games, they've sort of enjoyed success in very different ways. Say the same thing was kind of a critical hit. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, Disco Bees uh, monetized very well. It's kind of a sturdy game that mm -hmm. is what you want. And um, Make It Rain was kind of a runaway viral sensation. Yeah. So we don't know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> in a nutshell, um, we like the process of experimenting and finding new ways to be successful, and I think that as we go forward, we'll try to take things from each game, combine them into, you know, super games that are <laughs> successful in two or three ways. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's always different for us. I think longevity when it comes to gaming. Um, we have games like World of Arms or Order and Chaos Online that have been live for more than two years and we're still bringing new content all the time to users and seeing those users still being focused on playing the game every day, the retention, the engagement within those games that are celebrating their two plus years anniversaries is very impressive and this is, I think, what's the most interesting with the switch to freemium is that now not only games have a, a, a very long uh, life. I mean, you don't even know now when you release a game, it could still be live in five years with new content. So that's really what's the thrill with the industry is that it, everything is changing so fast and, and there's always new challenges. And so for us, really longevity and being able to have our games live after two plus years and being able to bring new content to them is really a sign of success. Yeah, we, uh, we look at the same thing, especially early on in the game. You know, we look for engagement and longevity and make sure that it's a fun game, that people are enjoying mm -hmm. it, you know? We're looking at the reviews and see how people react and, um, you know, we do a lot of testing and see, you know, are people, do they want to play it again? Mm -hmm. are they, you know, they, do they not put the device down? Uh, things like that. Uh, but though, I would say Concrete Software being that we're, you know, a smaller company, 25 people, uh, we are very careful about our games and we want to make sure that they make money. And so we look closely at uh, the lifetime values. Uh, we also look at how much time and cost it goes into the games as well. Um, or like a PBA bowling challenge, we spend a lot of time and money keeping it up, creating new events and things like that. Uh, where we do have other games that we call very successful and that like our Ace of Spades and Ace of Gin Rummy, where we don't have to have spend a lot of time. It's, it's actually uh, ad-based. 
mm. and we you know try to we we keep them updated. We keep you know. Uh, them working on the latest devices, though we don't necessarily spend a lot of time and uh, in effort to uh, create live events or things like that. I think, in, I think in the early version of Android, the most the most popular. I don't even remember how many of you were back in the in the early days of Android. The most popular game on the on on Android market was actually a a uh, solitaire game, and and because everyone wanted solitaire, it was about 50 kilobytes long. So it, so it was a no-brainer. Everyone just kept it on their device. I'm not sure how much people actually played it, but it was it was on every single person's phone, and uh, and and it's and there are games that are just going to be you know perennial things. You know that, that people are going to want to keep there. You know to have that little experience all the time, uh, versus you know then there's then there are things that are more engaging and and, and require more depth, and uh, and that's a different kind of success. Uh, so we look very uh, heavily towards engagement and retention uh, metrics as well. Uh, we love creating uh, uh, fantastic content for our players, and so we will uh, look closely in terms of you know what they're consuming and and, and what they come back to, uh, so we can uh, uh, you know build upon that. Um, and so, so that's one of the, 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 the big ways that, that we measure the success of our games. But uh, one of the things that I really like looking at is sort of the peripheral um, uh, uh, emerging behaviors of our users outside of the game. So when they start creating content, like videos, or they go on forums, or they create uh, strategy guides, right, and they start sharing um, ideas and, and approaches with one another, that, that's, that's how we know, okay, we're actually onto something here, um, and, uh, you know, we can possibly build on that. So that's always very, very exciting. And then you, uh, we've got other teams, but usually the rest follows. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the most exciting things about mobile right now is, is the ability to directly interact with your players and cycle really fast. I mean, I think, I think from, for me, the, the coolest thing about Google Play is you can, have a, you, you can come up with an idea, make a change, and have it out to users within an hour. And uh, you know, that's, 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 that's crazy fast. I mean, uh, you, know, you think about the console era of just a few years ago, and that you were, you were You'd, you'd finish your game, you'd send it off for testing, you would actually get burnt into disks. A month or two months later, you would get it out, and, na and then maybe we, you could patch it later. And you know, now we're in this position where you can just continue to tweak and engage. And I, I think for, from a product perspective, actually, for, for outside of play games, it's actually Tag Manager is the one that I'm super excited about, to be able to actually analyze trends and then tweak games very, very, very quickly based upon those trends. I, I, think, it's, I think it's super exciting. Well, we're, we're about out of time for the panel, um, but I wanted to give each one of you a chance to say, you know, kind of one last statement about the future of games. And uh, I know I'm, just, I'm putting you all on the spot here. <laughs> uh, future of games, Google Play, like keep putting GPGS in your games. I think uh, there, we have a long way to go. Like we're caught up a lot, but there is still uh, a lot of room for growth. You know, a lot of countries which are getting their smartphones now and they're all going Android. So. I'm happy things like what Dan just said makes the iOS guys jealous because we can turn around things much faster. So, uh, Mike, this is uh, the platform to be. Uh, I think that in going forward, I mean, at least for us, it's going to be smaller, faster games that we put out in a couple of months. And, um, you know, with infrastructure from Google, we can make something that works and monetizes and has all these features even in a really, really short period of time uh, so that we can just make a lot of games. I think innovation really is something that we want to focus on, really trying to always uh, bring something new to the market, to users, this new experience. So I would say really for us, it's going to be innovation, keep on doing great games and trying to have our users have the most fun they can. I, you know, I think uh, building a game to last for a really long time you know, looking at games being a service, um, you know, making sure you build infrastructure so that it's ready f to be around for five years, ten years, instead of just building a game to be around for a year is going to be huge for the future. Uh, I've been in this industry for, for 13, 14 years, and I absolutely love it. Um, there's no other industry that I can think of that, that innovates so quickly. And uh, whenever anybody puts something new and interesting out there, you know, my thought process is, can I put a game on it? Um, and so, you know, 
yeah, it, it's phenomenally interesting. We're looking at Android TV, we're looking at smartwatches, we're looking at Google Glass, and you know, it, it's all these other, these these interesting uh, platforms. You wonder, you know, can I put a game on this? Does this make sense? You know, where does this where is this going? And if it doesn't work now, will it work two three years down the line? Um, and so, yeah, innovation is the is the name of the the game here, um, uh, and uh, it's it's absolutely uh, exciting in that way. You, you you cannot take your eye off of what's happening around you, whether it relates to games or not because who knows you know uh, Android TV and uh, glass and smartwatch and you know games on your plate might be the next big thing you know who knows it's gonna be exciting well, thank you well I just wanted to I wanted to put up this slide a little early right because I wanted to make sure you had time to see it um, if you want to find out about play game services you can click on you can go to that click you can go to that link <laughs> also if you wanted to do feedback on this session um, you can use that QR code or that really really tiny tiny URL underneath there Please, please let us know what you think. Please uh, tell us what you want us to cover. Um, we uh, have a lot, of, a lot of great content here at IO, and, and I want to thank you again all for being here. And I want to thank our panelists especially for, for coming out and doing this.